something this morning we haven't done in a while here on your table. We're going to stand and greet each other. So as a company of displays, uh, let's all stand and say hello to everybody right around you. Now don't visit people in another church building. <laughs> Church, 
if you are available, you might see Miss Carol and tell them, uh, let her know that you could could help with it. Um, another prayer need that we have is for Brother Eddie Malady. Uh, I don't know whether all of you are aware of that or not, but Brother Eddie's uh, looking at uh, bypass surgery sometime first of the year. Uh, man of God that. Uh, Needs good help to carry on the kind of work that he does. So, so pray that that uh, the Lord will be with him and that the surgery will be successful and he'll be able to continue to show the same kind of vigor and energy that he's always had in his ministry. So, so do pray for Brother Eddie. Uh, there will be no choir practice this evening. Uh, got a gentleman here that's struggling to be here this morning, and uh, he's not going to make it back for choir practice. So. So pray for him that he'll soon be feeling better. We will have our evening worship service at 6 o'clock, so be back with us this afternoon. Uh, let's see, what else I've got in the way of the masters. No Wednesday night service here at our church. The community Thanksgiving service will take place Tuesday night at New Vision Church uh, at 6 o'clock. So uh, that will be our Wednesday, our Thanksgiving service for this week, uh, midweek service. Um, one other announcement, December the 9th, there's going to be an opportunity for you to go with the group from the church to <coughs> Christmas with the Chosen. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the hallways. If you'd like to be part of that, uh, please sign up out there. Again, uh, thank you so much for being here, your presence. Uh, adds to our worship today and, and uh, during this special, special season of the year, uh, it's indeed a blessing to see each face that's out there. And uh, I'd just like for us to focus this morning and this week, and really we need to do it throughout the year, on the reason that we give thanks, and that's because not of the things that we have that we're so blessed with, not of the physical, material blessings and the beauty of the world that we live in, but on the one that gave us all these things, and that's Jehovah God, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning. That should be the ultimate thing that we are thankful for, is a loving, benevolent God who loved us so much that He sent His Son to die for us. So, have a thankful heart. Have a grateful heart for a God that loves you so much that He's blessed you so richly and desires to, to be so personal in your life. Let's go to our Lord in prayer as we begin our worship time this morning. Lord, we're grateful to be in your house. Lord, thank you for the freedom that we have to assemble and to freely call upon you, Lord, because we know that you are the one that can answer our prayers. Lord, there's none other, and for that, we are grateful. Lord, thank you for Senator Wiley, who's here this morning, for his ministry, for his work in the political arena, and Lord, just continue to use him and Lord, just bless as he speaks to us this morning. Just allow your spirit to move in our hearts that your will will be accomplished and we truly will worship you and that we'll know that we've been in your presence when we leave here this morning. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, when somebody always asks me, how am I doing? I've always said, I'm doing great, but I'd be lying this morning because I've got the Tennessee crud, as we like to call it. But don't worry, I have antibiotics and antihistamines and all that stuff in my system, so it's having to be taken through. Uh, so we won't have choir tonight because I don't want to infect everybody. I want to do make some introductions, though. First of all, uh, Laura's niece, uh, Mickey, and her brother-in-law, Kenny Dunham, are doing the special music this morning. And we're happy to have y'all here. I'm glad I saw them last week. Wasn't trying to do it this week. And uh, 
Also, I'm going to introduce Paige Bodley, who's here. Now, we're both from Bolivar. Well, actually, he lives in Bolivar now. To say that I lived there when he did would be a lie because he didn't graduate high school to about seven years after I did. So <laughs> then he showed up in Bolivar after I left. So uh, it's great to have somebody from my hometown. Uh, actually, everything you need to know about him is right here at the bulletin. So uh, Brother Greg told me what to say, and that's exactly what he told me right there. So I'm not going to repeat it again. And uh, you can read that. And we're so happy to have you here today. FPC Oliver and uh, to have you with us. Now we're going to do some uh, music. <clears throat> Two hymns. Yes, give me a second to get to them. <laughs> Trust and obey and give thanks. And then after those two songs, our special music will come forward. We'll stay seated. Let's see. <laughs>
Good morning. How are you all? I'm Kenny. This is Mickey. Um, the song we're going to be doing this morning is called I Speak Jesus. Uh, it's a newer song, sung by an uh, artist named Charity Gale. Um, it's a powerful song because it speaks about the power of the name of Jesus. You know, I don't know what you may be going through, but all of us have our own life's journey. And sometimes it can be pretty overwhelming. Uh, through circumstances or what's going on with our finances or work or health or whatever. But I do know through my life experience that there is one name that we can call on when we need help. One name that is above our name. One name, uh, I love family, but it's above family. Because sometimes family can't help. Only Jesus can. And so this is called I Speak Jesus.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Nikki and Kenny, thank you for that. The name of Jesus. That's why we're here. That's who we are. That's where we have our meaning and purpose. The name of Jesus. Thank you all so very much for having me today to get to celebrate with you. To get to celebrate first the name of Jesus, but to get to celebrate this particular week with you. Thanksgiving with you. Uh, you know, I was reading in my devotional quiet time this morning about his presence and his peace. And that's what he gives us. And I, it, it just struck me all of a sudden, so much of this season we're about to launch into right after Thanksgiving, we're thinking about presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E what are we getting? What are we giving? When really every day, and particularly this season, we need to be focused on presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, His presence, His presence in us. The great presence of God with His eternal presence in Jesus' name, the person of Jesus. I, I couldn't be happier than to be with you today. When Brother Greg invited me to come, uh, it was months ago. I mean, obviously he knew his son was getting married, so he was making plans back in the early summer. I thought it was kind of unusual to get a call maybe in May or June about a speaking engagement in November. <laughs> But uh, I said, okay. I mean, I didn't have any conflicts back then. And so it was just such a delight. And as I, as I began to pray over coming to you and getting to, to, to share with you, I wanted to do something kind of fresh. But at the same time, God kept leading me back to something familiar that I think is refreshing. And I'll explain that more to you in just a moment. Um, Haywood County and Brownsville and Stanton and Nutbush and all around here are very important to me. We have so much for which to be thankful. And as, you know, I've had the privilege of serving as our state senator in Nashville for this past year. My gratitude has just really overflowed for God. Give me the privilege, but the two biggest accomplishments for me this year in our state legislature. Both had to do with Haywood County. One was the work to uh, pass some legislation that helped expedite reopening the Haywood Hospital, which I know we're all going to be celebrating with the ribbon cutting on January the 2nd. The other, obviously, was Blue Oval City, the mega site, which I know we, the greater we, had been working on, praying over, hoping for, for 13, 14 years. When I started in the legislature back in January, there was a lot of doubt that this was going to happen. Matter of fact, there was a lot of, of, of despondency that it wasn't going to happen because there was a coolness about it among some in Nashville. But thank God that through a lot of effort and prayer and work, <coughs> in June, we got an outreach from Detroit and Ford Motor Company with an interest. And every, it, was a, it was a rapid courtship <laughs> and a quick marriage, all for great reasons. So we have so many things for which to be thankful. As I was, uh, just a month ago, I was on the floor of our state senate in our special session that we had about Ford and fulfilling our commitments to Ford in Tennessee with the incentive for them. And I was presenting the legislation on the senate floor. And it was the, it, it might be the highlight of my legislative career in my first year. I mean, I just, it's hard to think of something bigger. But one of the things that I talked about during my presentation was how there had been such hope for this for years. And now here we were. And I compared it to one of my heroes in the Old Testament, Joshua, 
who, as you know, was one of those enslaved in Egypt that came out with Moses and had been a real believer that God intended to guide the children of Israel into the promised land. As a matter of fact, was one of 12 that was sent over into the promised land by Moses to scout it out to see if it was true what they had been told to expect. And he came back with the 12, but 10 of them reported, yes, it's true, but it's just going to be too hard to do. We can't do it. We're not big enough, strong enough to take that promised land. And he and Caleb said, no, we are. But the majority, unfortunately, prevailed, and they had to wander 40 more years in the wilderness, as you remember, before finally, 40 years later, all that generation except Caleb and Joshua have died off, and they're standing on the banks of the Jordan River preparing to go over, finally. But Moses has died, and Joshua has been now put in charge. And if you read that first chapter of the book of Joshua, which, interestingly enough, you know, Joshua is actually the same name as Jesus. They're the same name. Jesus is just kind of the Greek form of Joshua. Joshua. God saves. God saves. And God says to Joshua in the first chapter of that book, he says something that my daughter actually has... Uh, stenciled on a, uh, a piece of art over her three-year-old son's bed, these words. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. That was the promise to Joshua. That's the promise to us. Joshua led the Israelites over the Jordan. And I was talking about to our legislative colleagues in the Senate, this is our Joshua Jordan crossing moment here in West Tennessee and in Haywood County. Something that has been hoped for, worked for, and we're going across thanks to God's bounty. But I said something else to them, and I'm going to say it to me and to you. You know, when they did cross over, they still had seven years of fighting to do and seven more years of settling to do. My point being, we have come to a wonderful point, but there's a lot of work that we're going to be doing moving forward for all of us. A lot of blessing, a lot of struggle, a lot of change. Some of us are going to like it, some of us aren't going to like it as much. But you know what? It's going to be a blessing and an opportunity, and I hope that we'll see it like that. I, I have been so fortunate to have been a part of that. Um, and, you know, we really have so much for which to be thankful. We're called to enjoy his presence and his peace. And we do that by cultivating a constant heart of thanksgiving. Give thanks like we just sang. Thanksgiving. Um, we really are very lucky, lucky people to have him as our God. Uh, it reminds me of a true story that I have heard several years ago, and it appeared in the form of a lost and found column in a Midwestern newspaper. And the lost and found column read like this, lost dog, brown fur, some missing due to mange, partially deaf, blind in one eye, limps due to recent automobile accident. Answers to the name of Lucky. <laughs> now, when I first heard that, my reaction was much like several of yours. I just kind of laughed out loud and thought, good grief. You know, good grief. Who could call this dog Lucky? I mean, look at him. Mangy, run over by life, blind, deaf, limping around. And then I look at myself in the mirror, and I see my father looking back at me. And I think about all of us. And I begin to think, you know, this dog really is lucky. He's lucky because in spite of all of his flaws and shortcomings, being run over by life, somebody loved him. <coughs> somebody loved him enough 
to pay good money to advertise to get him back. And you know, that's just who we are. Someone paid a dear price and advertised to tell us to get us back. We're lucky dogs. You know, God loves us. He's come to guide us, to strengthen us, to protect us, to see us across the Jordan, whatever our Jordan is, to help us conquer, to help us overcome, and to be our good shepherd. Our good shepherd. We hear that term from time to time. And when you hear the good shepherd, <coughs> what scripture that comes to mind almost immediately? Psalm 23. It's the 23rd Psalm. It's, it's one that's, it might be so familiar we just can recite it by rote. We don't think about it. We don't linger over it anymore. It's just kind of, you know, one of those things that we see every day. It's kind of like when I was a kid growing up, uh, we used to drive by Graceland all the time. It was no big deal. <laughs> but later on, people said, oh, did you see him? Did, did you see him? I said, you do? No, never did. It was, he was just there. It was just there. We can do that sometimes. So I'm going today to share it with you again. I want you to listen to it. I want to walk gently through it. It's only six verses. And just kind of thinking about his presence and his peace and how thankful we should be for being so lucky. I want you to hear it again. I want you to kind of marinate in it for a little while, okay? I want it to remind us of some very timeless, some simple <coughs> truths. First of all, about whose we are. Hear that. Not about so much who we are, but whose we are. Who do we belong to? Where I grew up in LaGrange, Tennessee, you know, down in Fayette County, the older folks, if a stranger came to town, you know what they would ask them? They wouldn't ask them, where are you from? Like we would, maybe, they'd say, who are you people? <laughs> <coughs> who are your people? Who do you belong to? Whose are you? So I could say, I'm, I belong to John and Betty Wally down there. Who, whose are you? Who are your people? I want to remind us of that and about who we are, but what our response to our good shepherd and to our fellow sheep should be. Okay? So that's what we're just going to do this morning. It's only six verses long, but I want you to listen to it. I'm going to just kind of read some and talk some. And I hope that you'll find a time of refreshment with it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Who is your shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. To whom do you belong? You know, I mentioned Joshua again, and one of my I told you about the beginning of the book, where God gives him this promise. This is my command. You be strong and courageous. I'm going to be with you. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be discouraged. But you remember at the end of the book of Joshua, there's another famous quote. As he's bidding farewell, finally, at the end of his journey, they're in the promised land, they've, they've conquered it through God's help, they've settled it. And he asks, and he really demands of the people something. Choose this day whose you are, who you will follow, who your God will be. You choose this day, but as for me and mine, we will serve the Lord. Whose are you? The Lord is my shepherd. You hear the, the sheep talking here? And I'm going to tell you something. I didn't grow up with sheep. I bet none of you hardly did either. That's just not something we raise around in these parts. We might see goats some. Um, don't see a lot of sheep. But if you get to know something about sheep, and I've learned a lot about sheep, sheep are really stupid animals. They are totally helpless, totally dependent, 
can't fight for themselves. As a matter of fact, if they're attacked by a predator, you know, they may try to run away, but usually just turn their backs and wait for the inevitable to be overwhelmed by the enemy. They are totally dependent on someone, on a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in one. I don't have to worry. God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. You know, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be discouraged for I'm with you. I'm your shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet water. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I don't have to necessarily go looking for green pastures and I need a rest, I need a break. God is your shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He finds lush places for me. He makes me do that. He leads me beside quiet waters. Let me say that word leads me. I want you to notice that. That doesn't say he pushes me in quiet waters. He drives me in quiet waters. And there are different kinds of shepherds around the world. Shepherds in Jesus' part of the world led their sheep, right in front of their sheep. Okay? Other shepherds in other parts of the world get behind their sheep and push their sheep. Drive them forward. It's what you see on cattle drives. That's why they call it drives. You're pushing those sheep. You don't say, I lead my cattle. They're not following you. Sheep will follow. They know the voice of their shepherd. They won't follow any voice. They'll follow whose they are. He leads me beside quiet waters. Now, quiet waters, why does it say that? Well, I guess I almost think, well, we, we know about stormy lake, you know, and we know about flood waters and but quiet waters for sheep are something important because they will not drink out of moving water. Okay? Now you and I would. We'll turn the faucet on and when my wife's not looking, I just turn the faucet on the sink and I'll stick my hand under it and get a drink when I want. <laughs> sheep wouldn't do that. They want a quiet little bowl of water. You know, probably your cat won't drink out of running water if you think about it. They want a bowl. He leads me beside quiet waters. So this, this, this sheep is saying just what the shepherd needs to do. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We have been created by our good shepherd to enjoy his peace and his presence, but to glorify him for his name's sake he's doing. It. He's doing all this for us for his name's sake. He wants to be glorified. He wants to be lifted up. He wants us to enjoy this for his name's sake, to show who he is as our shepherd. He guides me in those paths of righteousness. He guides me. <coughs> He's taking me down those treacherous paths. I don't know if I, my family and I for years have gone over to North Carolina in the mountains for a week or so during the summer. And we always have this routine where we like to go up on top of uh, this Grandfather Mountain, it's called. And it's, it's, it's uh, you drive up it and then you can take these hikes. And there are these little paths and they get kind of treacherous. <coughs> You know, they go up the sides of some pretty steep hills, and there's a ladder to climb. He guides me on those. That's who he is. We have those paths that we're each walking. He's not telling you, to, okay, there it is. Good luck. The sheep wouldn't go there. We're not going to go there without him guiding us. He guides us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and all of us do, our valleys might look different, but we walk through the valley. 
health, finances, relationships, mortality, whatever it is, we're walking and we're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The shadow of death. Not death, the shadow of death. This the, you know, we know there's danger lurking. There are wolves about. There are predators out there. It's a shadow. It's not what is reality. Because, and I will fear no evil, but look at this now, what it says. For you are with me. You know, we've been talking, the sheep has been talking about the shepherd. But suddenly here, it takes a turn, and the sheep is talking to the shepherd. It's first person. It's not us having to talk about our God. That's wonderful. We should. But we get to talk to our God, to our shepherd. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, what are those? What are those tools that shepherds use? A rod and a staff. Well, they, they, sometimes it's the same tool, but there are two different ones that shepherds can use. The rod, you know, you've heard that term, spare the rod and spoil the child, but the rod is not for the sheep. The rod is what the shepherd uses to whack the wolves. It is, you know, your, your offensive weapon. <laughs> it is when you're being attacked, you know, and you have to defend your sheep, you're going to have something to use. It's like David is slain. You know, you've got something that you're skilled with. And shepherds can use it like you could use a bat. They could throw it. You know, like you could use some kind of a club you could sling and, and hit a predator that's attacking the sheep. Your rod and your staff, that staff is like a long stick. You've seen the crook neck that some shepherds will use to pull lambs out of a ditch to, you know, get sheep up when they're knocked down. It's not to hit them. It's not to punish them. It's to pick them up, not put them down. Your staff pulls <coughs> us out of those ravines and ditches we fall in. And when we think we can't go on anymore, we can't get up, <coughs> your rod and your staff comfort me. You might feel that staff up next to you saying, come on, you can do it. You know, I'm with you. One more step. You know, don't worry. Don't be Joshua. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Come on. I'm with you. And just, you know, feel the tap. Be like you. I've got four grandsons. And three of them are up and moving about. You know, five, three, and three, we've got a five-month-old. But I might, you know, if one of them falls down, I might reach down and say, come on, stand up, you're okay. You know, dust them off, pat them on the backside, and move on. Now, they, they look to you and to me. To figure out how am I supposed to react to this situation? I don't know. Am I supposed to sit here and cry? Am I really hurt? You know, but when they see their parent, their grandparent, our shepherd, say, like, come on, it's okay. You're all right. You're not, it's not as bad as you think. I'm with you. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, I want to back up just a second, too, and a little story I want to tell you, another true story. With that walk through the valley of the shadow of death and someone's there to protect you. When I was a boy uh, in LaGrange, one Halloween night, uh, I was probably seven, eight. I had a younger brother who's six. My dad loaded up all the kids in the neighborhood in the back of his pickup truck, and you could do that then. <laughs> Right around town. Nobody thought anything. Or maybe we were dumb, but we, it was safe in our mind. And after we trick-or-treated, he rode us out to the LaGrange Cemetery on Halloween night. It's a big, old cemetery. 
big U-shaped drive, you know. And he put us out at one end of the U and said, I'll meet y'all on the other side, have y'all walk through, you know. And so we started through, as you can imagine, a bunch of kids scared to death, kind of arm in arm, whistling, going down the road. Uh, and as we kind of made the turn coming up back toward the other exit, all of a sudden, this mass figure jumped out from behind a tree and roared at us. Well, what do you think happened? I mean, we were petrified, and, and just what you'd think. Uh, people took off in all directions, you know, flight or fight. We flighted, you know, we, we flew. Except my younger brother who for some reason had, had been carrying his bag of candy. And in those days, it was wonderful. You had big old heavy things in your bag. Caramel apples, you know, uh, fudge that the, 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 the women had made, just oranges, just anything that people throw in your bag. Well, I don't know what possessed him, but he charged this figure <laughs> with all his might, and he swung that bag and hit him right in the face. <laughs> And you know who was behind that mask. I don't know what possessed my brother to do that. You know, it was kind of shame me as the older brother to run away, and here he was defending us. But somebody, when we were going through that shadowy valley, fought for us. His rod and his staff, which happened to be a big old bag of heavy candy, he, he protected us. That's the shepherd. You're riding your staff. Come, you prepare a table before me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now think about that for a minute. A table. In, in, in the shepherd world, they could lead the sheep you know, through these hills and, 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 and up you know, treacherous uh, paths. But they come out into this flat land. And when we hike on Grandfather Mountain, you come into these big meadows, tables, you know, tabletops, lush grass. <clears throat> you prepare that for me in the presence of my enemy. So even though all the wolves are around looking, you have done this for me, and they can't do a thing about it because you, with your rod and your staff and your presence, are protecting me, and I'm totally at peace. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and they can only sit by <laughs> and, and grumble and wish you weren't there. But God's doing that for us all the time, isn't he? The, what we know out there, what the enemy can do nothing to us because he's prepared a table before us in the presence of his you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Here again, these sheep, helpless, they're out there falling down on rocky, craggy ground, grazing in, in arid places. It's not beautiful, lush fields like there are in Haywood County. You know, it's, this is the desert. Their faces are getting scraped up by the rocks and by life. And guess what the shepherd puts on? What they had. Oil. You anoint my head with oil. You provide healing for me. You take my wounds and you treat them and you bandage them. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Here again, we, we, it's a picture of that shepherd who would have water himself. And could pour it out into a cup for a sheep to drink when there wasn't a, you know, a still of water. And that sheep could stick its face in the cup, its whole nose in the cup, and guess what happens? It overflows. I mean, you, you give me so much, I can just get all up in it and drink it, and you're providing. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And the sixth verse. Surely, goodness and love, 
sometimes you see that as mercy, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Now we've been talking about being led by the shepherd. But something's coming behind too. Bringing up the rear is following me. Goodness and love. When I was on Grandfather Mountain in 2016, uh, every summer they have something called the Highland Games. Now the Highland Games are these kind of ancient games that they would have over like in Scotland uh, and Ireland where they're competing in all kind of kind of familiar but kind of weird contests. They have this giant pole, looks like a telephone pole that they'll try to throw. And, you know, they try to throw it and it's supposed to go up and hit the ground and roll over once. They have these stones that they'll throw like a shot put. They will have you know, just all kind of crazy contests. But, but one of the things that they had there were shepherding contests. And one of the shepherds had two sheepdogs. I've never seen sheep. I've heard the term sheepdog. But I've never seen sheepdogs work. These dogs were named Luke and Lucy. And Luke and Lucy were there at Banner Elk Highland Games. And what sheepdogs do, if they're trained right, they are constantly going behind the sheep nipping at them, you know, pushing them, kind of intimidating them a little bit, pushing them toward the shepherd. So as the shepherd's walking ahead, guiding the sheep, and some of these sheep begin to stray a little bit from the fold, these sheepdogs instinctively know their job is to round them and push them back toward the shepherd. And if they push them toward the shepherd, these sheep are going to be safe. Think about that for a minute. <clears throat> goodness and love, goodness and mercy, Luke and Lucy will follow me as a sheep all the days of my life. I am going to be safe if I keep my eyes on the shepherd Amen. and if I understand that love and mercy are trailing behind me and sometimes that means it's going to nip at me or bark at me, you know, or say, you know, be careful, don't go off that direction. <laughs> don't trust yourself that you know the right path to take. Because you don't. You obey the shepherd and follow, and you're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, you know, David, who wrote this psalm, also talks about his fondest desire. And I've begun to pray this prayer in the last couple years myself, is to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I'll be satisfied to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, just to be there, to be at your feet, to follow my shepherd and dwell all the days of my life. You know, Thanksgiving is a time to realize that we have our shepherd's precious presence, precious peace available to us. Sometimes we forget it. Sometimes we, like sheep, do what? Go astray. We wander off. But you remember in the 15th chapter of the book of Luke when Jesus is telling, uh, telling three stories about lost things. One of them is about a lost sheep. One of a hundred that gets separated. And you remember what the good shepherd does? He leaves the 99 in the open field and does what? Goes after that lost sheep until it was found. And when it's found, he joyfully, not scoldingly, joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home and has a party. Rejoice with me. This sheep of mine was lost, but now it's found. 
You know, God is pursuing you. And I imagine many in this room right now would already consider ourselves sheep. We're His. We belong to Him. We're Christians. At the same time, I know everybody in this room, just like me, sometimes finds ourselves feeling a bit astray. Feeling like that, that shadowy valley is bigger than we realize. Feeling a little bit lost. Wanting to be found again. Wanting to hear those sheepdogs barking to get us back, you know, with the shepherd. That's who your preacher is. He's playing a dual role, and we are too. We're all sheep, and we're also called to be sheepdogs to those folks out there who are lost, not even in the fold, needing to be told about the good shepherd, and those that have wandered off on paths well, they feel lost and alone and banged up and unlucky. <laughs> well, guess what? There's salvation here. And there's hope here. And God is here to be our shepherd and to guide us. I want to close by just uh, issuing this invitation to you. God is my shepherd. Just like you saw in that verse, I will fear no evil for you are with me in verse 4. He's yours if you want him. You may already have asked him to come into your life for Jesus, Yeshua, to seek and to save you. He's already sought you. He's already seeking to save you. You may be feeling a bit lost yourself today. You may feel like, feel like you've wandered off a bit. You know, sheep, what they do? They don't shake their fist in the shepherd's face and say, I'm tired of this. I'm getting out of here. I'm going my own way. You know what they do? They do what we do. They gradually nibble themselves lost. They see greener grass over here, and they wander. They wander away. They don't keep their eyes on the shepherd, and they wander off. Didn't mean to, but all of a sudden one day you wake up. I had a, a sister and her little friend back when I was a boy got lost in the Wolf River bottom. They didn't mean to, they did. The whole town turned out trying to find them. Republicans and Democrats, black and white, everybody was looking for two little girls who were lost. That's our shepherd. That's who we are. So in a moment, Brother Elvin's going to be down here at the base of the aisle. And I don't know if we're going to have any, any accompanying music or not. I don't know what the tradition is. But I'm going to ask if you would please stand and pray with me for a moment. And then we'll offer this invitation to respond to our good shepherd. Mighty God, thank you. Thank you that you're our Lord and our God and that you love us, you've sought us, you've, you're seeking to save us, to give us your precious presence and your peace and to make us the luckiest people in the world. If there's anyone here today, Lord, that doesn't know your call, Holy Spirit, please touch their heart and let them know the time is now. They can choose this day who they will follow, who they will serve. And if there's anyone here today or watching on Facebook feeling that you strayed, that you just didn't mean to, but you're cut off from the flock, Come home. Mm -hmm. Hear the bark of those sheepdogs driving you back to your loving shepherd. Be ready to hear, welcome home, <clears throat> rejoice with me. This was my sheep who was lost, but now it's found. Father God, whatever response you're seeking from each one of us right now, Impress on us and give us the courage to make it. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat>
for which we should be thankful. And uh, I know, uh, as I spoke to the Sunday school lesson today, that's the very thing that he talked about. Uh, and thank you for reminding us of that. And uh, I've learned this morning I've got something else to be thankful for. I'm thankful now that I know that I have a man of God representing me and us in Nashville. Amen. 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 I don't know whether you read your bulletin or not, but the information they had there on Brother Wally is uh, he is an ordained Baptist minister. So how is that important? That tells me that he's a man who knows to seek guidance with the Lord. And that's what we need in this day and time, I think. He's also a clinical psychologist, which I suspect comes in handy in the case <laughs> political environment. <laughs> uh, we appreciate so much your message and your being with us and letting us get to it personally. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn and we'll be dismissed. And we're going to have ushers at each of the doors to receive your offering as you leave this morning. So, right. Give thanks. Give thanks.